a tendency to speak extremely loudly, so hopefully the sound control can uh, keep control. Um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, in a sense, I feel a bit strange giving this talk in, uh, in English in front of, you know, certain uh, majority of French speakers here. I thought with the political developments everywhere in the world that the French nation would start going back to the 17th century and imposing French on everybody worldwide. And I was going to participate, you know, enthusiastically in this plan with my Québécois version of uh, French. But anyway, so it's going to be in English, but if you want private conversations in Québécois, I'll be very happy to, to do that with you. Um, so it's also a great invitation for me because uh, I get uh, two chances to get it right. There's one this morning about uh, science, which is meant to be a very serious talk. And then there's another talk tomorrow morning about uh, other aspects of uh, science, namely publishing, which is going to be even more serious, perhaps. But uh, let's start with the real business of uh, science. So I want to share with you some uh, progress and some ideas about out of equilibrium physics of uh, interacting many body problems. And uh, uh, I mean, this has been financed by various people. So the uh, NWO in the Netherlands and recently in the USC uh, grant. Uh, so what's cool of uh, uh, being a theorist is that uh, personnel is cheap. You don't have uh, uh, you know lab uh, things. So when you get a grant, you can hire like an army. Uh, so, amazingly, uh, I keep kind of uh, waking up at night thinking how hilarious this is. All those people were working on integrable models in my group in Amsterdam. So, a few years ago, maybe when I was a PhD student, uh, this would never have happened. This would have been some experimental group somewhere running some big apparatus. But no, essentially every single person here knows what the beta wave function is and knows how to use it for practical purposes. Okay? Uh, many people have, uh, have left a photo from a little while ago. But, okay, so what do I want to talk about? Really, I want to do a mix. I want to do a few minutes on uh, equilibrium dynamics, because these are things uh, I think you really should know. And I want to talk about very modern things coming from the last few years, developments from exactly solvable models that have to do with uh, interesting ideas in out of equilibrium physics. Um, but let me, uh, I mean, because this is quite a general audience, not necessarily comments matter and things, I want to start a little bit with a, a kind of a general introduction here. Here I see that for um, fine. Um, so the allegory goes like this. Uh, I was an Oxford man many, many years ago, uh, before the world went uh, crazy and uh, you know, politicians jumped off the cliff. Um, and uh, it was a strange college, uh, all souls, and it had many people in there that had very interesting characteristics about them. So Isaiah Berlin uh, was a great conversationalist. Thought this was the greatest uh, career, uh, you know, profession you could think of. He was like a political philosopher and general philosopher. But uh, he wrote a nice essay at some point about the uh, great poet uh, Archilochus is saying. So I mean, the essay is about Tolstoy and literature in general. But the saying from Archilochus, uh, which is interesting here, is that the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And I like using this as an illustration because for me this is like a separation of philosophies among theorists. So if you're a fox, you believe in field theory, you believe in universality, you believe that uh, essentially uh, you can always write down some effective theory for whatever model is thrown at you and provided you're smart enough with renormalization, perturbation theory and things like that, you can say something interesting on it. On the other hand, you might be a hedgehog, in which case you know one thing, which is the expression for a beta wave function. And uh, the history of the last decade and a half is that the little hedgehog has kind of understood that these things pertain to higher algebraic structures that have a great degree of universality. Um, and these algebraic structures also open the door to very complex but controllable manipulations, allowing you to compute very complicated things. And then, you know, the, the more physicists minded from those uh, realized that these things were of direct relevance to things that were uh, experimentally observable. So my kind of summary of the history of integrability over the last 15 years is just that the hedgehog has transmogrified into a fox. And now we can go back and compare to these things here. And ironically, we have many things to say. So I just want to run you through a, a few of these things. Okay. So, um, a one minute introduction to beta ansatz, if you don't know it, it's actually quite simple. Uh, so take a quantum system for which you can start with a simple state, maybe a vacuum state, no particles around. If you're dealing with a magnet, maybe a fully polarized state. And if you start creating excitations on that, then 
uh, it could be that your many body wave function looks a little bit like a collection of free waves. Okay, so if you have n particles, then essentially in beta set solvable models, what happens is that the wave function is a combination of free waves that are combined together with relative amplitudes so that the Schrodinger equation is solved. And they're parameterized by internal quantum numbers that you can think of as like momenta of internal particles. Very importantly, there's a kind of classification principle, a kind of Pauli principle, that allows you to think of your space of states as if it was a free fermionic theory. Okay, so, uh, so the idea here is that you can use all these concepts. If you want, it's a complicated version of the Fourier transform. Okay, it doesn't always work, but when it works, uh, it always takes this form. So, um, what can we, uh, uh, you know, uh, what can we study with these things? Well, there are systems of interacting uh, atoms, there are systems of interacting spins, so uh, quantum chains, magnetic chains that are uh, important here. So, two models, a Lieb-Linegar model of interacting bosons or you know, fermions or whatever you want. Um, or you know, Heisenberg spin half chains or even higher spin chains. Okay, chains, so one dimension. Okay? In general, we only know how to do these tricks in one dimension. Um, and the applications that these things have, they've become quite diverse. So in quantum magnetism, there are many things. I'll show you a few things here. In the field of ultra-cold atoms, we've also started doing real uh, fitting with experiments here. And there are things for the future, and really things coming out of the past also, where these models are very important. Um, so the general idea of everything we do in my group in Amsterdam is very simple. So what we, what we start from is an expression for the physical situation we're considering in terms of beta states. So maybe we're going to consider a ground state of a system, maybe we're going to consider a thermal equilibrium state of this system, and then we're going to do something to it. And this something can be something very, uh, very smooth, maybe we're going to flip a uh, spin somewhere, or maybe something hard, maybe we're going to change an interaction parameter and see what happens. Uh, it doesn't matter, we only need to know the first few chapters of Quentin uh, Nuji uh, et al. Uh, and do the textbook quantum mechanics if we want to compute our things. The point is that all the physics that we want to express is expressed in terms of for example, matrix elements in the basis of the exact beta states. Okay, so it's just a complicated technology, but the actual underlying quantum mechanics is very simple. The complexity comes from the fact that we're dealing with many body systems. Okay? So, uh, what can we do? Well, uh, some very quick examples, things we can calculate for spin chains, we can do time and space dependent correlation functions. Um, these are important for an elastic neutron scattering. I'll show you a few examples of that. For the lead linear gas, we can do similar things like density density correlations or you know, momentum distributions. And these are important for experiments in cold atoms using these methods. Okay. Now, uh, the idea is that we can just build the correlations for these things piece by piece. So we have a basis of eigenstates from the beta ansatz, we get the matrix elements that we need in the Lehman representation from algebraic beta ansatz and higher technologies, and then we can sum over intermediate states, either by doing some advanced numerics here, just evaluational numerics, not simulational, uh, or in some circumstances we can also do some advanced analytical tricks on these things. So the kinds of things that we get are like this. So this is a calculation of the spin-spin correlation function in a Heisenberg spin-half antiferromagnet. Here you have momentum, here you have energy, and this is the actual response function. You know, color coding just shows intensity. So uh, there are a few things I want to say about this. So first of all, um, uh, the response function that we can calculate with integrability is accurate irrespective of the energy that we have here. And this is a great contrast to more traditional methods, for example, based on asymptotics, conformal field theory, you know, uh, fixed points, which would only be able to describe the response at the extreme limits of low energies. Okay? So I, you know, with integrability I can put myself here and get a very accurate description of the correlator here. And that's actually extremely important for the uh, uh, utilization of these things. <clears throat> so I'm sure you're, you're suffering from the same thing that I am. I'm always uh, asked uh, by people who have no understanding of the technology I'm using what it's all used for. Uh, and then I like to show them this uh, illustration. Well, okay, fine, you want to summarize it, so I'm the cook. Um, and I use uh, results coming from the little gnomes in the forest, 
and I feed them into the demanding clients, which are the experimentalists. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that uh, you can summarize where I position myself. Okay, so maybe uh, uh, explicit results uh, here. Um, one of the uh, important people in the field was uh, Ludwig Fadev. He was extremely important because he had a, a whole school um, uh, in Russia uh, developing the technology behind these things. So he died recently. It's just a reminder. Okay, so here's a, a, a kind of showcase of a simple thing that we can do. So I take a, I take a spin half antiferromagnet, and at t is equal to zero, I take one of the spins and I flip it up. And I plot the magnetization profile in there. Um, so integrability gives us predictions uh, for this, the, well, it's the actual uh, integrability calculation here, so there are also predictions from CFT and stuff. But what we can do is we can actually do some real space-time evolution in this thing. So this would be the profile of the uh, antiferromagnetic order just moving around. So the, the waves that you see in here, they're like water waves propagating out. And they're very quantum, of course, but they still propagate with a certain group velocity, etc. So we call those waves spin-ons, and you'll see the effects uh, later. Essentially, they, they carry most of the correlations that, uh, uh, that I showed you. Now, the point of these correlations is that they have uh, real relevance to experiments. Experiments uh, uh, made with inelastic neutron scatterings. You just throw neutrons at crystals that are well described by collections of weakly coupled one-dimensional magnets. And you can make a correspondence between the theory and the experiment, which is really accurate uh, everywhere. And that's the funny message I want to convey here. The correspondence is accurate everywhere, except in one region. And the region where it doesn't work is the universal region. At low energies, the experiment is affected by loads of other things. So you cannot make a correspondence between the experiment and the theory here because things break down. So everything you've read in the textbooks about, uh, uh, as a theorist, you having to concentrate on the universal region and stuff, there's actually a bit of a snake hidden under the, uh, uh, the rock there. Uh, it's not actually true. What is robust experimentally, if you go to higher energies, then you're actually better described by the fundamental model, and then we can do much more accurate things. Okay, so I'll be happy to have a discussion about that if you, uh, if you want to hear more. Um, so, uh, just a, a last example here, so I always find this one funny because it's a rather easy crystal to synthesize. You might have done it in high school, though not in the deuterated version, it doesn't matter. Uh, this artist here, Roger Bjorns, um, amused himself in coating a whole apartment in London with copper sulfate. Uh, so I think he has the greatest collection of uh, Heisenberg magnets in the known universe. Uh, I tried to contact him to, uh, you know, underline the importance of this thing, but he wasn't really interested in the physics uh, behind these things. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, anyway, so, so that's it. So the idea here is that, again, we could do some exact correspondence. Interestingly, there was no fitting parameter between the theory and the experiment here, and the correspondence was, you know, uh, better than it was before. So, okay, so that's the kind of thing that we can now do with integrability. We can really work as a phenomenological tool for many experiments. Now, in the field of cold atoms, uh, 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 much progress has been achieved uh, on the experimental side. On the theoretical side, we were also able to do some computations of response functions for this, and then we were able to fit those things with measurements that were done either in, uh, in Florence um, uh, or in, uh, uh, in Innsbruck uh, here with a kind of tunable gas. So here I just want to advertise again that uh, there is experimental correspondence with the uh, uh, integrability calculations here can be used a little bit as a kind of way of doing thermometry in these systems, uh, but uh, there's still a lot to do. Okay, so hopefully this is going to uh, carry on in the future. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, uh, equilibrium summary of what I wanted to present uh, to you. But now I want to go to the much more, how can I say, modern and perhaps exciting bit of, uh, of the business. And uh, here again, I want to start with an illustration to just motivate why we do this and um, why we use the methods that, uh, that we do. Um, so we go back to uh, age-old classical mechanics. Now let me consider a rigid uh, pendulum. So this is a stick. And you all know that, uh, well, perhaps you all know, that if you start vibrating the suspension point of a rigid pendulum, if you vibrate above a critical frequency, you will create a second possible equilibrium, which is that the pendulum will start oscillating, but with its head down. 
What I find really cool about this thing is that this was only explained in 1951. Okay, it could have been explained a couple of centuries earlier, but it wasn't. Uh, so, uh, Piotr Kapitsa is the one who kind of uh, wrote the figures. It's a nice little paper, essentially. You need to do a kind of pseudo renormalization calculation, integra integrate out fast modes, and then you get this. And if you don't believe it, well, uh, here is my construction of it using my son's Lego, if it can go. So, uh, the piece of Lego is vibrating at about 20 hertz, and you see it's kind of approximately oscillating uh, upside down. So, what's the point of this illustration? The idea of this is that if we only look at equilibrium physics, we are rather limited in the states of matter that we can consider, because equilibration really is quite a tough constraint. Uh, uh, it might be that you're not able to find equilibrium systems that have the properties that you want. However, if you give yourself the opportunity of smartly manipulating your systems and maybe activating them in a, you know, judicious way, you can stabilize states of matter that might have more interesting properties. Okay? And that's the kind of general idea. And now I go back to what I was telling you before about integrability. The whole point of integrability is that we can write exact wave functions irrespective of their energies. So if you're going to start doing drivings, pumping of energy in your systems, most of the methods that you're used to as a theorist are going to start breaking down. Forget about universality, forget about scaling and things like that. You're actually pumping entropy into your system and your methods fail. It doesn't work. So at least with integrability, we hope that we can make some headway into finding examples that we can robustly describe of situations where we indeed stabilize interesting states of matter. Okay? That's the kind of general idea behind it. Now, the way the business works is that you, you sit down and you kind of think of all the models that you know, you think of all the situations that you can consider in these models, and then you start finding a collection of isolated cases that you can handle. Okay, so this is a, a, a list of things that, uh, uh, that we came up with, uh, uh, with you know, various degrees of um, out of equilibriumness in them. Uh, first of all, uh, there's the pulse category. So essentially here what I'm thinking about is some, um, uh, some initial state that you obtain by doing some beyond linear response action on your system. Um, then there are the quenched systems. So quenches essentially have to do with changing some global uh, variable in your problem. So here you might change some internal interaction parameter between pairs of particles, but if you do that in a finite density state, things can uh, be quite complicated. And finally, what we really want to do are the driven systems. Okay, so it doesn't have to be periodic driving per se, but that's where we start. Okay, so I'll show you some examples of, uh, of these things. I want to talk about some, uh, some what I consider as quite important progress here uh, in quenches. Uh, then I want to give some examples of uh, each of the three categories here. And we'll see how much time I have to actually show you uh, the details. Okay. So let's just uh, 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 talk a, a little bit about uh, 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 quenches at first. So you probably, um, uh, well, I guess you couldn't avoid many of the discussions in the literature about uh, equilibration in isolated quantum systems. So you will probably have heard keywords like generalized Gibbs ensemble and things like that. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit what this is about. So consider an initial state um, which is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian driving your time evolution. So you, you prepare, say, a gas of atoms uh, in, uh, uh, in a ground state or in a thermal state at a given value of interaction between the particles and at t is equal to zero, you change this value of the interaction parameter. You might think that this is completely impossible, but actually it's day-to-day -day business in the field of cold atoms. They can use so-called Feshbach resonances to tune the interaction to whatever they want. So they can do such experiments here. And the point is, of course, that if you start driving the time evolution with the wrong Hamiltonian, you're going to get a heck of a, heck of a lot of dephasing occurring, because this wave function here might be very complicated to express in the basis of the eigenstates of this one here. Okay, so there's extremely complicated dephasing that shows up. And if you have a closed system, dephasing is the only thing that you have. But somehow you would expect relaxation and equilibration to come from this dephasing. That's a bit of the mystery, actually. Really what you want to calculate are time-dependent observables. So you tell me what you're interested in. Maybe you're interested in momentum distribution functions, densities, correlations, uh, whatnot. Just say what you want, and we will plug it into 
this sandwich here and try to calculate uh, uh, this, uh, this function of time. Okay, so that's the kind of overall challenge. I want to give you a couple of examples of uh, situations that, uh, uh, that we were able to control. So I'll start with the simplest quench that, uh, 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 that we looked at, which is the one from a, a Bose-Einstein condensate-like state to a repulsive gas. So let me, again I'm working in 1D, let me consider a 1D channel, yeah, here just for illustrative purposes, periodic, in which I've got particles prepared in the ground state of the non-interacting system. So at t is equal to zero, every single particle has momentum zero, and I've got n of them. So if you want, this is like a canonical slice of a BC. And now what I'm going to do is at t is equal to zero, I'm going to switch on repulsive interactions between the particles. Of course, at t is equal to zero, I've got loads of configurations where particles spatially overlap each other. And when I turn on the interaction, suddenly, these pairs of particles, they obtain a very high interaction energy. But what you expect is that you know, suddenly they become repulsive, so they fly out. Yeah, they kind of explode away from each other. So you would expect that the momentum distribution function, which is this big peak at zero, at t is equal to zero, would broaden as a function of time as particles explode away from each other. So that's what we want to, uh, uh, to try to describe. Okay, and um, so if you want, this is like a very practical setting. The, the real deep theoretical question is, if you have an isolated, closed quantum system like this, and you do such a thing, it's not coupled to a bath, it doesn't have any relaxation mechanisms, but will it equilibrate? Uh, and if it equilibrates, will it thermalize? Okay? And the answers to these questions are, are coming out of, uh, of these things. Okay, so let me just explain to you the, the method that... Uh, is there a question? Let me just explain um, in pictures the, the method that, uh, uh, that we developed to address these things. Okay? And you'll see it's quite an appealing method because in the end it just uh, uses what we love best as physicists, namely some kind of variational principle. So just uh, uh, to illustrate the, the problem, let me consider um, a certain Hamiltonian and let me put myself in an eigenstate of this particular Hamiltonian. Now if I represent the space of all possible states this box here, my initial state is just this point here. So this is really defining a many-body state, including all its correlations, everything. But now let me consider the very same many-body state here, but write it in the basis of a different Hamiltonian. Okay, so without changing anything to the state, I'm just changing its representation. So um, this Hamiltonian here does not commute with this one. And that means that the eigenstates are very complicated to relate to the eigenstates of the original Hamiltonian. And the converse, also this state here, becomes a huge linear combination of eigenstates of that particular Hamiltonian here. But it's exactly the same state. And now what's going to happen is that if I drive the time evolution with this Hamiltonian here, all these amplitudes here will be conserved except for their phase. Their phase is going to start oscillating according to their energies. So all the dephasings are going to occur between states here. And if I have a certain observable, essentially the question is, how does the, how does the, the Lehman representation for the uh, expectation value evolve in the presence of all these dephasings? Okay? So let me now just define for you this kind of variational principle to see what, uh, what happens. So we're going to consider a very large system. So the number of eigenstates that I have here is exponentially large. And the spacings between the energies becomes exponentially small. Now, let me define a measure of importance okay, that is written here. So what I do is that I say, you know, so forget about Gibbs uh, free energy and stuff like that. Let me just define a measure of importance in terms of the overlap. And this measure of importance is going to be minus log of the overlap of the initial state with the state you're considering. So if the state you're considering has a very low overlap, this measure, this pseudo energy, is infinite. Okay? And if the state has a very large overlap, then this measure becomes lower. G 
Due to the fact that you have to conserve wave function normalization, this measure has to be bounded from below. Okay? And there's a kind of sum rule with this measure also that you, uh, you preserve the normalization. The important thing is that it's bounded from below. So if you start driving the time evolution, what's going to happen is that your system is going to uh, want to dephase to the bottom of this distribution here. Okay? So this state at the bottom of this uh, effective action describes the steady state that you get a long time after you've performed this quench. And the descent into this steady state is characterized by the states in the vicinity of this, um, of this state. So another way of saying what I'm saying here is that if you do normal equilibrium physics, you have one Hamiltonian that drives the time evolution and that sets the equilibration. And it's the same Hamiltonian. In these settings here, you have two Hamiltonians. There's one that drives the time evolution, and there's one that sets the equilibration. Okay? And essentially the second Hamiltonian, if you want, is, yeah, is the one that defines what I've called this uh, quench action. Okay? So it's just the way, the way it happens. In closed systems like this, there are these two different operators driving either the time evolution or the equilibration. Okay, so the point is that in order to find these states here, you now just have to do some variational calculations based on the knowledge of the overlaps with your initial states. It's a complicated technology because these overlaps are quite complicated, but in some circumstances, you're able to find those things. So, so that's a, a, a paper from a, a while ago in my group that was the first case that we actually managed to solve, which was for this interaction quench in the deep linear gas. And then we showed that the equilibrated state was a non-thermal state with particular characteristics here. So this was really the, the, the first uh, analytical solution for a quench to a non-trivially interacting system in the thermodynamic limits. I was quite happy with that. There are loads of technical details on this. But the, the message here is that uh, in these settings, you could actually provide some exact solutions for this that actually showed that most of the expectations uh, that were made of these things were actually wrong and you needed to look uh, deeper at the details. Okay, so that was a, an example of a quench. Let I me mean, keep the details for further discussions. So just to briefly flash uh, another situation, we can also do these, uh, these games in lattice models. Um, uh, for example, we can start from a purely anti-thermomagnetically ordered state, and then time evolve it according to um, just the usual Heisenberg Hamiltonian. That means just spin exchanges, so the up and down spins would trade places. So this also has a quite uh, you know, complicated time evolution, and there's a long story behind it of how it uh, actually equilibrates and what it equilibrates to. It's a non-thermal state, once again, that we could uh, characterize. So I'll spare you the details, but just to say that now we essentially understand almost everything that can be understood about this uh, quench here. The time evolution profile is still difficult, but the actual steady state, what it equilibrates to, is fully understood. Okay, so. Uh, and the fun thing also for the more mathematical buffs uh, in you uh, is that we can actually uh, obtain an exact analytical form for these things. So, so if you've ever done beta ansatz, or if you know a little bit about it, you might know that in the end beta ansatz is really, really nice, but what it really gives you are sets of coupled in, uh, integral equations that you can't really solve and you still have to put on the computer. In very rare circumstances, can you solve those equations analytically? And this turned out to be one of those cases. So we were able to solve analytically all these coupled equations and give really the uh, analytical description of uh, everything that happens. Okay, so again for the mathematicians in you, I think there's probably very deep mathematics associated to this uh, solvability issue. And uh, I, would, uh, I would think that some discoveries are waiting to be made in there. You have a question? So when you go to large times, at some point your expectation values stop depending on time. But they are not, so they are equilibrated, but they are not thermalized. So if you were, uh, so I have a state which is uh, uh, living at a certain energy density, but it is not thermal. The distributions are not thermal. I haven't... Uh, ergodically sampled my things. I've essentially sampled things in a sub-ergodic way, 
has been locked into regions that are not dominated by the usual Gibbs thermal states. It's, it's, because I'm, it's because I'm quenching in integrable systems, so I've got non-trivial conserved charges that change everything. Yeah? So, of course, if I were to quench in a 2D system, then I would expect everything to thermalize. But that's related to yet a, another discussion that I'd love to have with the more formal among you. I think uh, the, the reflex within the community is to call a system either integrable or not. And I think this is wrong. I think the correct uh, way to think about it is a bit like in, in complexity theory. So, so you know, I really like George Orwell. One of the things I say is that um, uh, all regularizable quantum models are integrable, but some are more integrable than others. And there's a whole gradation. It's not on or off. Okay, so free models are more integrable than Heisenberg spin chains. Heisenberg spin chains are more integrable than all the chassis chains. And then, you know, 2D models are like exponential complexity class integrable models, which means that they're not integrable for practical purposes. But I'd be very happy to discuss uh, about these subtleties with uh, aficionados among you. Okay, um, so um, maybe I have a bit of time to, to give you now some, uh, some other settings where we can do some out of, out of equilibrium calculations with these things. Uh, this particular one, it starts with a, a nice story. So in 1834, there was this uh, gentleman, John Scott Russell, who was uh, walking uh, on the Union Canal in uh, Edinburgh, uh, when he saw a barge suddenly stop, and then a wave detach from it at the front and start propagating. Uh, so he wrote a communication about this, and uh, in his communication, he said a slightly different story, which was that he saw all of this, but he happened to have his horse, and he followed this wave for a couple of miles until it dissipated in the channel. So, um, so he thought this was remarkable because, of course, it went against uh, the vision that we have of waves, which are these regular things, uh, repeated patterns uh, all over space. Uh, this wave was localized in space, um, and it propagated without deformation. Okay, so it's two main characteristics. So uh, this is a reconstruction of this wave of, solitary wave of translation in the actual uh, Union Canal by a bunch of academics up there. Uh, so that's what academics... Again, I come from Amsterdam, so I'm kind of compelled to call it the Cortevec de Vries equation. Uh, but of course, we're in France, so let's just give the credit to Joseph Boussines, who wrote the equation a couple of decades before. Um, you have nonlinear classical evolution equations which support exact solutions. Ironically, this is related to two different numerical works that were performed, the first one around the wire. Um, so, a bit after the war with the technology developed then, the fem famous Fermi Pasta Ula, um, and you know, so women in physics is all, uh, a very important thing, uh, so like I like to joke, uh, so Mary Tsingu actually did all the calculations, so she ran all the codes, she was the one doing the simulations, uh, but she was a woman, and therefore, you know, not uh, appropriate to put as an author on publication. Um, Fermi, however, uh, being Fermi, uh, and even being dead, uh, could still be an author of a publication. So in those days, it was better to be a dead male than a live female to be an author. So hopefully uh, things are changing, so please, when you talk about Fermi Pasta Ulam, call it Fermi Pasta Ulam Tsingu, uh, because she's the one who did everything. But what they did is that they simulated uh, classical nonlinear uh, uh, degrees of freedom coupled to each other to test for ergodicity. These were debates they were having with uh, John von Neumann back then, etc. And one day they let the simulation run a bit longer than uh, they should have. And what they saw is that the tightly focused in energy initial state spread, but then refocused. So it's like an inversion of ergodicity. So this was very surprising. And in the end it was understood that uh, it was related to the existence of these exact solutions. So in another numerical uh, paper, uh, Zabuski and Kruska really nailed the concept of a soliton. So what they did is that they considered time-evolving profiles with this uh, Boussines-KDV equation, 
and they saw world lines of solid arms colliding, but then they realized that in addition to being spatially localized and propagating without deformation, these objects, when they collided with each other, they emerged from the collision without deformation, only a kind of displacement of their world lines. So again, this was numerically observed, and that led to the beautiful mathematical side of things, which is the classical inverse scattering method, okay, which is really uh, the thing I learned when I was uh, a young student in Montreal, and that got me into integral models in the first place. You know, really, possibly the most beautiful thing in mathematical physics in the 20th century, at least as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so, so that's the story. So then, uh, one day I was thinking about this thing, and I was thinking, this is all classical, this is all really nice, but I'm a quantum guy, so I want to see the quantum version of this. I want to have quantum waves displaying these things. So then, um, uh, that's what we did here. So if we look at this here, essentially the idea is that we start with the long spin chain, and then we have some, um, some excitations that I put in the system, and thrust towards each other so that they collide. So I've got some like magnetic waves that come and hit each other and you see there's a little displacement, there's a little kink in the displacement here due to the interaction, but they emerge from the collision undeformed. Okay? And I call them quasi-solitons because they're not stable to infinite times. If you were to go to late times here, you would see a kind of 1 over t spreading coming just from normal uh, normal dephasing of wave packets. Okay, and there are some experimental predictions of what can be observed for this displacement here. These experiments have yet to be performed. So if there are some cold atom uh, experimentalists here, it's not. It's, uh, IPT. But maybe you can uh, uh, lobby your uh, experimental colleagues to do this because I think this would be a really nice experiment. Okay, um, so the idea of this is that you can now do very um, complicated time evolution in integrable models by using the idea of so-called generalized hydrodynamics. So this was invented by a bunch of uh, young people, so a group of Italians, uh, Bertini, Colura, Denardi, Sfagotti, and then also Bolaja uh, Castro Alvaredo, Benjamin Royon, Takato Yoshimura. And then one of these papers was published in this uh, glorious new journal here that you should all be aware of, and if not, you will be tomorrow morning. The idea is that you start from a spatially inhomogeneous state and you let it go. And the time evolution of this would be extremely complicated were you to describe it with the exact microscopics. However, what you can do is say, uh, you just have distributions of fundamental particles and because of the local state, these particles have a certain velocity and the only thing that you have are these exact particles flying around. So if I illustrate this concept here, it's just a continuity equation with the dressing equation. And the idea of the dressing is that if you have a soliton in isolation, it moves at a certain velocity. But if there is a gas of other solitons in the background, then its effective velocity is affected by the presence of the others, so it has an effective velocity. So that's the dressing. And that's it. And now you can write a 15-line Python code that will calculate for you the time evolution of these systems can go back to uh, important experiments that were performed in these isolated systems, for example the Newton's Cradle experiment, and you can start doing calculations that predict uh, observable you know, spatial and momentum distribution functions for these things, including interaction induced dephasing and dephasing induced by the shape of the trap, etc, etc, etc. Okay, so there are some key players here, uh, so Jérôme Dubai is really the driving force behind all of this. Uh, continuing collaborations with experimentalists on these things. Okay, so there are loads of cool things. Let me just skip this. And let me let me just finish with one idea for uh, for the future. We're actually, you know, working on in Amsterdam. Now, I really want to go to um, driven systems here. So what I'm going to do, <coughs> what I'm going to do, is that I'm going to take uh, uh, a situation where instead of doing, you know, like sinusoidal driving, I'm going to do quench dequench sequences on a certain Hamiltonian. Say I'll take a quantum gas and I will flip its interaction parameter according to this kind of sawtooth-like uh, behavior. Okay, so that's my Hamiltonian as a function of time. And I want to see how it goes. So it's a bit of a generalization of the quench problem. It's just that I do quench dequench, quench dequench. 
But still, I would expect that at some point there's a form of stroboscopic equilibration that can occur in those systems. The idea is that if I have a, an integrable family of Hamiltonians, the time average Hamiltonian would be also integrable. So here I have like a variety of bases in which I could describe this problem. I could describe this problem in the eigenbasis of H1, or in the eigenbasis of H2, or in the eigenbasis of the average Hamiltonian. So it's like I can use three different method ansets uh, to, uh, to describe this. Right? But of course, it's complicated because these things don't commute with each other, so I scramble all my stuff. So what can we do? Well, at the moment, admittedly, we can't do um, as much as we would want. So there are some cases that, we, uh, 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 that we've worked out. Uh, here's an example with the uh, Heisenberg chain, where we modulate the anisotropy. But I just want to leave you with the general idea here. I was talking at first about preparing interesting states of matter. Now, uh, although this is a bit of a spaghetti, this is exactly what this graph shows you. So let me, for example, consider this. So on the horizontal axis here, I've got the period of the driving. So I'm here, and period is zero, which means that I drive at infinite frequency. Okay? Which means that my states are just the eigenstates of the time average Hamilton. But if I, if I start driving at a slower frequency, then I go up these curves here. And the point is that there are these avoided crossings everywhere. So if you're familiar with the landau zener scenario, what I can do is non-adiabatically change the frequency to jump over this transition, and then adiabatically come back. So if I start driving at infinite frequency, but then I reduce the frequency fast, but then I re-accelerate it slowly, Going back to infinite frequency, then I jump and I come back. And I prepare a state which is different from my initial state. And the fun thing here is that if you start from the ground state, necessarily the state you hybridize with is the highest energy state. So if I do this protocol, I can do some completely non-local transformation here, hopefully in a controlled fashion. And that's the kind of path for the future that we're trying to control in other circumstances. And with that thought, I'll thank you for your attention. started doing the driving, your system would try to synchronize with your driving at some point. And of course the Floquet Hamiltonian itself is not integrable, but you can still describe the synchronized states in the basis of your integrable states. You can, you can try to compute which synchronized states would be the ones to, to survive. So if you want, they obtain a mascot, they just disappear. 
Um, however, if you look at higher energy excitations, so if you were to, to give a, a spin excitation very high momentum and energy, then most of its evolution at finite time would still happen in 1D. And only later would it hop. But that doesn't matter because you have seen the 1D for a long time, very accurately, before it actually decays. So that's why the 1D-ness is much more robust at higher energies than at low energies. So that's the contrary of what RG tells you. But RG, unfortunately, the, the, the mistake of RG is that it only considers um, uh, energies. It does not consider matrix elements. The correct way to do renormalization is to do it including the, the matrix elements. And if you do that, you get a very different answer. Concerning yeah, the quench action method and the interpretation as a variation principle, can I see this as, or should I see this as a, a direct variation principle in a space of better states? Is there a way of formulating that? Um, um, so the, the quench action idea, if you want, at first is uh, um, uncoupled from beta ansatz. The only thing it requires is a basis of eigenstates for you to tell me so. So I really want you to give me the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian driving the time evolution after the quench. And whether you give me those Hamiltonians using a very smart you know, matrix product state construction or some, you know, uh, uh, some other not the right means, it doesn't matter because you would, you would have the same thing. So, so you really have to view it as uh, uh, exactly the same thing as Gibbs, uh, if you want the equilibration, um, uh, but just with a different Hamilton. It, but it, it really is, you, you can literally take the textbook of Gibbs and just replace the Hamilton by this other operator. That's the beauty of it. Okay, well, last question, you. Yeah, can, can you say, so you say that, uh, okay, uh, so you say that uh, you think that there are different classes of integrable models? Yes. Uh, one, I mean, it's, let's say the, uh, the one that we would call maybe chaotic in classical mechanics are exponentially complex. Can you say something more, or in particular in relationship to the problem of thermalization of local observables? So yes. So all these things are related. Yes. Uh, you give me like one minute to answer this, that's the challenge. Okay, so, um, so first of all, there's a huge difference between the classical and the quantum cases, because in the classical cases, of course, your Hilbert space is immediately infinite dimensional. You use very different coordinations for your for your states. So when you think of Kant theorem, you think of closed orbits, of like observables, like particle positions and momenta. In the quantum case, I can put myself to extremely quantum situations like Heisenberg, where really uh, the, the discreteness of the local uh, quantum space has to be seen also in the time evolution. So the space of states is coordinated in a completely different way. However, what I'm saying is that if I were to take an initial state which was non-thermal and time evolve it uh, according to a certain Hamiltonian, there would be a time scale for the observables going towards an equilibrated one and a functional form associated to it. And if uh, a system is more integrable, then it decays faster to a more thermal steady state in you know, some measure with some rules or so, so a concrete example, I, I believe that the Heisenberg spin chain is more integrable than, say, the holding chastity spin chain. And literally, this means that if I start with an initial state, say the nail, and I plot the time-dependent profile of an observable, like the stack of magnetization or correlations, holding chastity is going to decay faster, go more thermal than the Heisenberg one. And you would call both of those integrable. But my, my point is that the degree of integrability is observable in this time evolution. So I think you can actually measure it. And then in 2D, uh, by, uh, by definition, these things would thermalize very quickly uh, because of the scrambling. Thank you. Thanks. So I think we should move on to the next talk.